boy Indy at the Witty City. City. TX boy, and you know I'm looking pretty. Got pretty. diamonds on the ring. I got diamonds on the pinky. Mm. I used to go to school and be infatuated with Miss Pinky. I mean, her name was Miss Clinky. I mean, that was Jazzy Fire. I was the type of dude to go to school and get live. I'm really not trying to cuss, but I'm still trying to bust. Yeah. I mean, when they hear me touch the microphone, everybody <laughs> gonna fuss. They just be fussing. No, I'm on air, so I must not be cussing. And every time... I'm in this studio, I'm like a Russian. We up here. Good afternoon, Dallas College. Richland campus and all the other campuses as well. My name is Professor Jeff Manzi. I'm the faculty advisor for the Philosophy Club and you are at the philosophy, the official Philosophy Club hang, the Philosophy Club radio hour. Every Monday from two o'clock, quote unquote, to three o'clock, <laughs> quote unquote, uh, we are broadcasting live from KDUX Studios, KDUCKS, quack, on Richland campus we are the Thunder Ducks. The Philosophy Club Radio Hour is an extension of the Philosophy Club proper. Philosophy Club proper meets every Wednesday from 2 to 3 in Wichita Hall, room 211. Topics are suggested by the students, voted on by the students. We pull the philosophy out of everything. I challenge anybody to give me any topic under the sun, <laughs> and I will make it philosophical because it is already. It's all a matter of recognizing, of identifying, of refining. And what a refined day it is today. All right, I got some <laughs> guests in the studio with me here. Crickets. Uh, hey, yeah, seriously, I mean, Kelsey, <laughs> you, you couldn't fake a laugh? <laughs> All right, well, now that's... That's, 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 that's a good one. Is that, is that too much? Is that too much? I think I you're making... Yeah, I think that's how Aaron actually laughs. So, you know, <laughs> I'm joking. Okay, yeah, so... I didn't see any like difference with his actual laugh. <laughs> Whoa! Oh, <laughs> it's spicy. Holy oh, macaroni. Oh, yeah. Mama Bear's in the studio. Um, so here we go, folks. <laughs> Uh, yeah, now a couple of uh, announcements. <clears throat> so there's been some wacky wild weather in, uh, in Dallas the last few weeks. So uh, we did not have a radio show last Monday, and then our club meeting got canceled last Wednesday, Wednesday due to inclement weather. So we're back, and we're going to discuss two meetings, I guess two Mondays ago, technically the last meeting, but two Mondays ago, the topic of which was natalism. And then uh, last week's topic, which has been delayed to this week, this Wednesday, 48 hours from now is civic obligation. So we'll see if we can't tease civic obligation in the end, but let's also first and foremost give natalism its fair share. I know it seems like a lifetime ago, but we had a pretty interesting conversation on natalism at the club meeting, and uh, happy to touch upon some of the conversational highlights there. But before we get into all that, folks, before we get into what we like to call the re-quack or the quack back, we're going to make introductions. By the way, uh, as of an hour ago, the mask mandate for Dallas College is officially lifted. So uh, it's recommended to wear masks, but not maskatory, like I'm mandatory. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and so, yes, uh, I am not wearing a mask so that I can speak clearly Fight to the, the mic. Yeah, for the first time <laughs> in two years. Okay. So having said that, uh, let's make an announcements. Let's make introductions. Uh, again, you know this crew. We got three familiars and a newbie. We'll start all the way at the end there with uh, Corinne. Hello, everybody. My name is Karen Patry. Oh, just real quick. Uh, uh, yeah, move that mic so we can see her. <laughs> Who is that? Is that, uh, is that the newbie? Yeah, move that. Yeah, uh, move it up. Uh, yeah, so we can. You there you go. Oh, hey, there she is. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> I'm here. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Karen Patry, as Professor Mansi already said. Uh, happy to be here to enjoy another wonderful discussion with this crazy guys. <laughs> I'm <laughs> supposed the, to be her son. <laughs> and the new we guy. Well, I, I, I used to say my two sons, but I was trying to sound formal. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to hit the ball on my <laughs> left. No, my right, I'm sorry. Are you a club officer, Karine? <laughs> yes, I am. Oh. I am a, a club officer since last semester. That's right. Still supporting Absolutely. And we'll continue on this journey. Yeah, Kareen helps out with the social media. Glad to have her on board. And uh, basically everything we do. Yeah. Who do we got next? Who's adjacent? Uh, 
It's uh, it's Kelson, the man that will always teach you a lesson. Uh, <laughs> hey, hey, guys, man, every single time, man, I'm, I'm trying to be a politician, which means I have to come up with, like, a cool slogan that, like, everyone can, like, relate to and understand and stuff like that. But I'm Kelson Canoe. Um, I'm, I'm always excited to be here. I'm vice president of Philosophy Club. Amazing experience. I've been vice president vice president since last semester. Amazing, amazing experience. Um, I love it. Professor Manzi is a joy. Natty is a joy. Thank you. Uh, Karin is a joy. My gentleman right here. Hey, what's going on, everybody? Uh, my name is Natty. Uh, I'm also one of the officers. Great to be here. And I'm so happy that Max is going to join us with our topics. Yeah. And yeah, uh, on a, I'm, I'm one of the officers and I do upload the YouTube videos. Pretty much that's what I do. Yeah, that. He updates the websites. Um, uh, websites too, yeah. Yeah. All right, cool. So yeah, those are some of our student leaders uh, and then maybe a, a perspective one. Introduce yourself, Mr. Uh, Mr. Newby. And then there's me. Uh, my <laughs> name is Max. I'm a uh, first year philosophy student, actually. Nice. Awesome. Long well, that makes you president Amazing. automatically. I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, glad to have you, Max. Max has been coming to the, um, to the club meeting since the semester began, uh, always with really insightful contributions. And I got to say, I love his taste in music. He broke me off with a mixtape of, not his mixtape, but a mixtape of songs. And uh, yeah, it takes me back to my youth. Appreciated it. Um, yeah, I don't know if people know this, but Max is actually my stepson. Oh really? No. Philosophy stepson. Yeah, yeah. He's my yeah. Ideologically, he's my stepson. Correct. I was about to say, um, I'm the only one allowed here to sell mixtapes. Any, <laughs> this is my mixtape zone. So there's a, there might be a lawsuit in your in, in your future, Max. <laughs> I'm gonna lawyer up. Yeah, you, you gotta go. dress like him, bro. Uh, okay, yeah. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and then, yes, as, uh, as explained earlier, I am the faculty advisor slash host, Professor Manzi. And, uh, yeah, I just want to say thanks for tuning in. It's been an awesome episode. Um, will we see you next Monday? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> we didn't get to the conversation yet. Okay. So, uh, again, today's topic is natalism, uh, which was, again, the previous meeting's topic. Now, again, natalism, does anybody want to throw out there a definition for natalism? Uh I would say it's essentially the idea that... Um, Eat that mic, man. Especially with the mask. Yeah, get yeah, right, right close the, to it. The idea that... Much better. Or natalism or antinatalism? Well, we'll go natalism, and then we'll talk about what's anti. Uh, support of uh, birth, yeah, essentially. Pretty much. That's all really it is, is to support the... Uh, yeah, support birth. Um, promote it. Encourage it. So antinatalism would be those who subscribe to reasons why maybe... Um, 100% promotion of birth in all circumstances isn't necessarily uh, ideal or maybe even practical. So that was the, uh, that was the general topic. Um, we got a lot of perspectives at that meeting. Um, well, let me ask you all uh, fr from your memory here. <clears throat> I mean, do you think that there were more people who seemed to be in support of natalism or antinatalism? And, and again, keep in mind that this topic came as a direct development of the prior week's topic. So, again, we were talking about the American dream initially. Um, and then from there, it turned into a conversation of, again, what is and is not uh, available in terms of opportunities. And then that sort of played a role with perspectives on natalism. Well, I guess I'll ask you all, without necessarily having to fully commit mind, body, and soul to the position, is there any position anti or pro or any aspects of those positions, again, painting with a broad stroke, that you seem to be, uh, you find especially appealing or provocative? We got a knock at the door, folks. Take it away. I'll be right back. Um, well, I just like to, I, th I think the whole anti natalism point comes with a rhetoric, comes with an agenda, comes with an anti American, anti human agenda. I think now, I think now the rhetoric is common that, um, that the world is ending, that the world is bad, that our problems are too much for us to handle when prior generations would have laughed at our problems and would have smiled and, uh, and seen the obstacles that we face and, and welcomed them with a smile. I think, I think this newer g generation of people, we're, we're soft, we're nomadic, so we have all been comfortable all of our lives. We've all been stuck in a bubble where, where things are, are, are fed to us. And whenever we have to work for something, whenever something isn't hard, I feel like a lot, a lot of us tend to avoid this avoid this situation overall instead of going through that obstacle or like in the words of Molly Cyrus it's the climb you know and whenever you see a mountain you have to climb the mountain instead of avoiding the mountain 
All right, let's get a little karaoke going. So I, I have a question uh, that just after listen what uh, here my, my <laughs> kind of song says. Um, so we can say that nihilism is a, a, a social cultural thing, you know, the rather than uh, like something that the human being actually needs is more like a pressure from the cultural or the social environment. Uh, see, I don't, I, I, I think you're right. And I think depending on your lifestyle, you know, because if you're a, a third, you know, if you come from a, a third, a third world country, you know, your parents want to have as much kids as possible because those kids could help out on the farm. Those kids could uh, like, like help acquire more resources. However, in America, we live in such a nomadic time. We live in such an instantaneous microwave, like a microwave era where we want our things instantaneously. So whenever we face an obstacle where we cannot get those things instantaneously, our, our next resort is to just quit. It's just say, okay, the world is so bad. We can't do anything about it. We see our problems. And instead of of looking up the great things that our population has done, like decreasing world hunger, like cloning foods and 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 and, and different plants that are sustain that us that are sustain us as people, we don't see the benefits and stuff to that. We see the problems in it, and whenever we test those problems, we tend to, especially when we live in a nomadic time period in Western America, well, in in the Western part of the world where things are just handed to us, where it's so much easier. You know, the West is the standard of living is so much, so much more comfortable than it is, you know, in, in the harsher parts of the world that whenever we face a problem, I feel like we just avoid the problem instead of, you know, you know, you know tackling that problem head on. So I, I just okay. want to add something, uh, what you just said, uh, my song <laughs> is, uh, <laughs> uh, I, I'm not fully uh, agree with um, the, the 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 view that the f people that works in the farm or live in the farm has more children because they want their children to help out with you know producing and getting uh, more resources. I think this goes more t into a cultural environment. People that is in the farms, like my country, you know, in, my, in the country where I was born, lack of education. When you lack of education, your resources are a limit. And you uh, play into survival stage on your mind because the only thing you, you are capable to do is to survive. Now, you don't have other views. So I think um, naturalism goes more like a cultural thing because in places where the education is high or if you live in authoritarian environment like or like China, you know, where the law says one children or I mean one child, you know, I believe recently has changed, but it was one child for year, decades. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, it's different, but I think it's more like a, um, like a, the lack of education would drive people to have more children. Mm -hmm. Okay, interesting. Uh, so Professor Manzi. Before like getting into, could you give us like the perspective of the philosophical perspective of nihilism? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, well, I mean, it's it's a varied perspective. You know, uh, it depends on who you ask, and you know, also how they justify their uh, their arguments in terms of specific philosophers. But in general, yeah, I think uh, the concept of natalism, um, again, as Max articulated it, it's it's pretty straightforward. But to your point, the depth of each position, it could get pretty deep. So, on the one hand, uh, and maybe this is a good way of approaching it, you can say to yourself, well, natalism and antinatalism boils down to uh, perceived values. And this gets to Kareem's point about culture and, you know, where values come from. Uh, okay. So, those who are antinatalists, um, and again, I'm really, I'm generalizing here, uh, could be those people who don't value birth or, you know, uh, life as much as they value maybe, or we could say new life, as much as they value, say, resources or the quality of life for those who are already alive. Um, so it's a, it's a value decision. Whereas others maybe say, well, no, uh, it's a good thing that, you know, we promote the reproduction as something of an intrinsic value if you feel as though life itself, as the condition for all values, has to take top priority. 
at the expense of, say, you know, diminishing the resources for um, everybody's fair allotment or, you know, to your point, sacrificing a quality of life um, for the sake of just encouraging a new life, even though it lessens the quality of the entire family's life because now there's another mouth to feed or you want to look at that on a nationwide level. Of course, there are some people who, interestingly enough, argue pronatalism, not necessarily because of a love of life, but for more practical reasons. You know, you might say, for example, our particular community is running out of warm living bodies. People who believe this need to start reproducing with other people who believe this, so this stays around, so this community maintains. So again, it's not so much because they, they admire the, the life itself and they're in awe of it, but they're just like, well, no, if we don't keep reproducing, our culture is going to go extinct. So yeah, those are some different ways of approaching it. Which is what is happening uh, nowadays on Japan. Right? Okay, the government yeah. is uh, incentivizing um, their population to get married. You know, there's, uh, there's even programs that pay males, you know, to date with certain uh, females that were not able to get married at, at a certain age. You know, so there's, there's sort of incentivations in countries like when you read this you're you're like how this can be possible <laughs> you know but mm. but are things that happened when you know when um your culture is on threat of disappear yeah i think that's true and then you know even pushing it further the incentivization doesn't have to necessarily be specifically monetary yep. for example i mean if you believe in christianity you're very much incentivized to you know have kids yeah. Because that's, it's not just, you know, you get a financial incentive or anything like that. It's because uh, it's deeper. It's a more metaphysical incentive, an afterlife kind of incentive. However, I do want to ask you this. Do you think that there are unintentional incentives in certain communities or nations or cultures that, uh, when I say unintentional, I mean it's to your advantage to have a kid, but it's kind of maybe gaming the system in a certain way? Well, I think I think we have a lot of that now because there's a lot of people who play the tax system now in America. Like there you, you know, you know, yeah. there, you know, there's a lot of people who create like quote unquote foster homes, treat the children like absolute crap, but they still have those foster homes, and the government gives them anywhere from one to two k per child per month. You know what I mean? And and then you get one to two k per child per month. You only spend what five hundred dollars on all kids. Maybe if you're a bad parent, if you don't really care, which there are some people there. There are bad people at at every, every position, every, at every walk of life. So they ch only spend half of that or a third of that on the kids, on food, on on clothing, and they pocket the rest for themselves. They and you know they have nice things in their personal life. You know, I think I think I think that's that's a very real real thing. I think now. You know, with certain, st with certain st st stimulus checks, there's now something called the tax child credit, which uh, yeah. w which you can get an extra amount depending on the child and the age of the child and certain like like disabilities or, or, or obstacles you or that child may face. So, but I think that that that's something that goes on throughout the history of time. It, throughout the history of time, there's always been government. the The main problem between the government and its people is taxation. That that's that's one of the main problem when it boils down to it the government wants to know how much can i take without the without the people hating me and the people job is to find loopholes to not get or to not pay the the government they've been doing it since like uh, feudalism with lords and kings and they do it now with the irs you know what i mean there's nothing new under the sun and there will always be loopholes or people will always try to find loopholes to not pay in taxes and and yeah. children and children which is we People like to say it's a capitalism problem, you know, that like um, that kids are that kids are quote unquote invaluable and it's and it's like a burden. Because I do understand the sentiment that hey, if I'm a mother, a child is gonna cramp in my style. You know what I mean? I can't a <laughs> a a a I'm less economically valuable. I can I can work less. I I have to work less because I have a I have, I have a body inside of me. I cannot be on my feet as much. I cannot carry as a heavier load. I cannot do this as much. I cannot. I don't have as much energy. So 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 if we're talking about 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 a pure economically, pure GDP stance, a child hampers that for the duration of of of, of your of your of, of of your pregnancy. It it hampers that. So now we have to see how do we how do we counteract that? Because at the end of the day, you still have to put food on the table. 
you still have to put clothes on those on those on those on those kids back and then in a, in a lot of situations especially in in, in black households 77 percent of kids grew up with, with only a single parent household so how do you counteract the fact that a mother is economically less less productive while still having to carry the burden of, of taking care of a child you know so like so like yes there has to be some exemptions and and it's, and it's just naturally it's 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 a natural safety net as it's a natural safety net to give like pregnant women or women that that are that are mothers you know like like exemptions on on tax laws i think is just right and yeah fair. maternity leave and stuff like yeah. that yeah no i think excellent excellent points um and you know it, and not, not to counter it, but to bring up something you said at the meeting, actually. Uh, I, I mean, you're, first of all, you're absolutely right in, in so far as the incentives can be based in logic. Yeah. Uh, you know what I mean? So it's not as though the incentives are completely contrived. Uh, yeah, I mean, as somebody who's you know, eight months pregnant can't really do work depending on the nature of the job. Um, especially not like especially not like manual labor work if you're yeah, yeah. You know i mean if you're like a sales rep and you just have to take phone calls even that gets stressful because like you don't really want to deal with like an angry person over the phone while, while carrying a baby because a baby is such a fragile yeah. thing any type of stress any type of unbalance can cause like serious like 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 problems so i i i, I understand that and like and like you know it is it is like derived from logic yeah, and you know what? Before I forget, we should suggest taxation as a, a topic for philosophy club. Amazing, some, I think Ama that's that'd be a good one. Amazing, I'd really like to look at that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, that, I mean, yeah, I mean, taxation takes on so many different. Forms. But okay, the point. I mean, another point that uh, that you raised that I, I think we should consider is this idea that you know, at the end of the day, she has to put food on the table. But I mean, really, at the end of the day, food just has to be on the table. It's not necessarily, again, this is building on your point. Uh, it's not so much that the parent has to be the provider if the parent is under certain conditions where they can't provide. And that's perhaps when government intervention seems most logical. Uh, and again, how, how is the government able to provide financial support for somebody who can't work but is pregnant? goes back to taxation um, and uh, other stuff. But okay, so keeping all that in mind, those are sort of those specific examples of how individuals might side on, you know, natalism or antinatalism depending on their, I suppose, individual vantage points or maybe perhaps lack thereof. And so it's not necessarily pure sort of theoretical logic that's getting people to side one way or the other. Oftentimes it has to do with their personal circumstances which dictate their positions. Having said that, um, <clears throat> I, I mean, I think this is something that I, I meant to highlight uh, at the meeting, but I, I forgot to. Um, well, there's only one person in this room who has experience of being a parent, yeah. who, of raising a <laughs> child, and you know now, now yeah. she's got ideological children. <laughs> but um, I have more than two. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> she has two, two more. But, but you know, this is a this is you know a part of it. Um, pregnancies can be very difficult. And so the experience could be very painful. Um, sometimes it could be, again, painful on, on, on the family in terms of, you know, added stress and, stress and pressure. And so the question becomes, well, can we ever say universally, <laughs> the heck is that? Um, can we ever say universally that, uh, again, objectively speaking, it's better or it's not better or it's worth it to endure the pregnancy and the stress or it's not worth it? Um, I'm not going to ask you if you think it was worth it or not. Obviously, you know, I believe you feel it is no, worth I it. No, I mean, uh, <laughs> you, can, you can ask any question you want, and I'll answer. Who's uh, your favorite professor? <laughs> um, Be careful. No, I, I mean, <laughs> I, I have some serious doubts I'm considering right now, so I, I better <laughs> give my answer in the later show. <laughs> He's going to give you a zero. <laughs> very tread lightly. I'm going to submit a change of grade form for the last semester. <laughs> She's been absent for the last 90 days. <laughs> No, hey, uh, what's I mean, I mean, going back to what uh, Manson, Professor nice Mansi just asked me, um, Feel free to grab a seat. Take a if we go to right the there. biological standpoint, of course, for a woman, it's yeah. a very challenge. Um, yeah. You know, it's very challenging to have a pregnancy, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, even that you are very healthy or um, young. You know. Your, the, the changes your body experiences every day, it's 
are amazing. Are not easy to describe like in an app where you go and you see, oh, the fetus is developing this and that, or the fetus now weighs such and such. It's not like that. You know, the, the, the feelings, even your whole body, the feelings change. The, your emotions change. So the change is very dramatical. It's, it's always um, before and after being a mom. Mm, you know? okay. The experience, uh, I would say, uh, it depends from the viewer in, uh, who gives the answer, who gives the validation to whatever hears or sees. Okay. But in my experience as a viewer, as a mother of four, it has been the most rewarded. Uh, okay. Even with the challenges that brings up, is the most rewarded. All because right. when you see those human beings walking and trying to stand in their own feet and you see them taking their decisions or at least trying to take their decisions, whether they make it wrong, you see those little beings are, are, are the product of you. Yeah, you made them. And are, exactly, it are the extensions of you and you see you reflected on them and you see the opportunity to change things that you can see you were doing it wrong. You okay. Know? Yeah. So it, it seems like it's a uniquely wonderful, enriching experience. In my in okay. my point of view, yes. Okay. Your original question was that um, were you regarding nature versus nurture as far as natalism is concerned for the motivations behind natalism? Mm. Would you? I'm sorry. Well, I guess essentially I'll just comment that. As far as natalism is concerned, th there is a biological motivation that I think is worth considering. It's at least significant. Um, you know, you're incentivized biologically, uh, physiologically to reproduce. Yes. We wouldn't be alive here. I mean, there's, if you consider there's a long continuing strand of uh, common ancestors going back millions of years. Mm -hmm. So that's significant in itself. Yes. Yes, it is. Yeah. And so again, that's kind of the, uh, th that's related to the opposite side of the, the coin from what was mentioned earlier, which is that uh, maybe antinatalism is kind of saying, well, you know what, maybe we're, we're overly populated to, to the point where there's um, not enough to go around. And but so, that, yeah, yeah. Let, let, me, let me just uh, remind something you said at the beginning. That, sure. uh Antinatalism uh, is people that so is already seeing the world overpopulated, and that's why they decide not to have more children. But it also can be people that is it's too happy with happened. the <laughs> life that they have, you mm -hmm. know, because having a child is not as strength. easy as it may sound, you know, it's not, uh, it's not as, uh, to, to give you an example, if you go into those many it's millions so of apps said, that is out there <laughs> to show you how the human body will transform in the period of nine months with the gestational time is, mm -hmm. you know, and you will see, oh, that's all that it happens, you know, like, like a teenager or a young adult, you're going to see, oh, that's all that it happens. But it's not that's all that it happens. It's mm. so much more that you cannot put into words, you know, that you cannot mm. show. And, um, and I think that there's two sides for, there's two kind of antinatalism. The ones that consider the world is overpopulated and the ones that are too happy with their own self and consider that that's their choice. Okay, yeah. interesting. Yeah, and I think that's, that's a good point. That pronatalism is very much pronatalism and antinatalism just isn't necessarily against life and procreation just it's it's asking you to temper it which is to say y y you know maybe it has to be based on context you know circumstances or individual choice as opposed to you know everybody should strive for this I don't know that I would agree with that. I think there's definitely... Cut his mic. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm joking. I'm joking. Keep it's it's on the loose. It's on I have my two sons over here to defend. No, no, please, Max. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> and this one, this one has a big gun. He has big guns, too. No, the, uh, but I think there's definitely a, uh, a subgroup of people that are rather highly against birth. On, on the grounds of... That's fair. As, a, as a moral judgment. Uh, and that's, that's also a statement... That's interesting about the, uh, the nature of reality, to some extent. How so? Well, in the sense that if you believe that existence is suffering and bringing yes. a 
a new life into existence is going to cause them suffering, then, and you believe that to be immoral, then you would logically be rather vehemently against birth. But how uh, you can be uh, even completely certain that it's going to be suffering only? Well, it's almost a human fact, uh, or a fact of human existence. So it's based on an assumption that in reality. It's, I, I mean, suffering is inevitable. Yeah, you're yeah, going to experience suffering pain. Suffering is inevitable, that's for sure. But, I mean, you can, what, uh, what I'm trying to say is you cannot reduce the experience of a human being to just suffering because that's not all that is going to happen in the entire life. Touche. You know, so uh, I think that the human experience, it goes beyond suffering. And uh, I mean, whether you decide uh, to get children or no, that's your decision. What you utilize uh, to support your decision is based on the information you gather through the years or experiences, right? But what I'm saying is there's two positions. There's the position that see, uh, um, like, like you said, you know, like I won't gonna bring children because they suffer. And there's the other position that says, well, I'm too happy with who I am and what I have. I, I don't need no, no children. I don't need to feel pressure from the society saying that I'm not completely fulfilled until I have children. You know, that's what I see at naturalism more like a, a s cultural issue, a society cultural issue, because it's society who determines and, and brings you to the belief that if you don't have children, you are not fulfilled. Okay, yeah. So, so let me um, kind of support Max here because I love your position. I love both of the positions here, and that that was a lot of the discussion, honestly, that Wednesday. Wha which was again, <clears throat> if you could say that pain is objectively bad, and the conditions for the possibility of ever experiencing pain is life, well, then every time you enter a newborn into the world, you're celebrating that newborn's future pain. Uh, you know, and pain is something that we experience on a variety of levels, you know, emotional, spiritual, physical, and the possibility every second of every day is open that you might get hit with but some pain. Just, just to, to add something. No, the, please. The, yeah. the fetus is experiencing pain since the moment it's created. Yes. It's fighting against bacteria and, and trying its way out to grow. So every, every <laughs> my nanometer that grows is painful. So that's what uh, the terms of pain uh, are broader than what we are trying to understand. Yeah, and, and listen, I only bring it up because uh, in a weird way it also supports your point, which is that, well, <laughs> not encouraging life, specifically in your own life, so say not, not growing a family, um, <laughs> growing a family, I feel like I'm talking about a garden, <laughs> uh, not, not having a family uh, could also result in pain. Um, you know, in terms of regrets or, you know, seeing your friends have, you know, experiencing the, 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 the wonders of uh, impregnation and birth. I mean, you might say to yourself, well, now I'm feeling pain for not encouraging it. That's where the importance of the decision that you take in your life is based solely on your emotions. Oh, and, and ev I mean, you can consider everything that is in the outside world in your society and your nurture but it has to be you who made the ultimate decision. Okay. Because biologically, well, in the men, in the men, there's no um, that difference that in the females. Now, biologically, females can have children. Well, nowadays, probably even more than 40 years old, you can still have children if you have the money to support all the medical things that you have to go through. But in men, there's no that age gap. You know, men can have children at any time. So, it, and well, I mean, if not you, well, yeah, not necessarily. If you can yeah. support it, if you want to, you know, if you want to be involved in the children's life and development, well, you, have access you to need to be. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's what I meant. It's a blue pill. Yeah, 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 or, the blue chew. Or if you're at a gas station line. Yeah, not talking about the blue pills over here, guys. I was talking physiologically. <laughs> it's not always the case. So behave. Oh, yeah. I think I think the whole I think the whole anti-natalism, anti-human birth came from the 1968 book The Population Time Bomb by Paul R. Elric, a Stanford, pro a st a st a Stanford professor and his wife Ann Elric that said that around 1970s and 1980s that the whole world is going to is is is, is going to face famine and and starvation and and all these 
insanely obstacles in in the in the main cause of that was because of overpopulation. Yeah. When when he didn't account for innovation. He didn't account for the human he, life finds a way to live. Life finds a way to go on. That's the beautiful thing about life. That's why th that's why I struggle with my religion sometimes. I struggle because because there is darkness. There is pitiness. There is death there is torture i struggle with my with my religion sometimes but the thing that keeps bringing me back is life finds a way to live okay. and and that's not and that's and i feel like that's something that's given to us i feel like that's i feel like that's something from a higher power that's given to us so so i feel like the the population time bomb by paul r elric he didn't account for innovation he didn't account for in, 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 ingenuity he didn't account for the advancement of the human species by cloning by creating new, by, by by creating abundance of food by cloning, I you know. Yeah. I you think know, you're making great points. By yeah. by 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 using by using different technology to dig deeper to find new by to find new glaciers of fresh water. He didn't account for it. He didn't account for trying like, to colonize the moon. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Mars, Mars like, yeah. like 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 he didn't account for an Elon Musk. He didn't account for a Jeff Bezos. He think everyone was just going to be was just going to be slave to life when when the whole point of life is to is to conquer life, is to look life in the, because life is death. You know what I mean? You you're going to eventually die. That's 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 the that's the end of the movie. If someone asks you how this movie ends, it's it, it ends by you dying. You know what I mean? But 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 it's Flip not it, but it's not all about you dying. You know what I mean? There's there's so much innovation, there's so much technology that comes to living in the and the, the purpose of living and the striving for living that I feel like there many people who follow this anti natalist point, they they kinda they don't account for that. They don't account for life finding a way to live. They just I, I, they just feel like it is like we're stuck on this on 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 this on this cycle. I would just add something uh, to the beautiful things you just said, my son. Is life ends on death? Yes, but you decide what the legacy you're gonna leave behind is. Well, do you decide, or do other people decide? You if you decide. if you if you are mature enough to decide what to leave, you will. If you are not mature, of course you're gonna listen to what your society or wherever you try to fit in, and you're gonna leave that. I'm just saying, you know, Hitler might have said, "I'm an innovator," and a lot of people would disagree with him. Yeah. You know, you decide you decide what your legacy is. History and everybody else decides what your legacy means. Okay. That's I yes. like that distinction. Yeah. Yes, I love it. Thank you. Yeah, no, good points. Okay, so let me just, because everybody's really uh, been, been sounding off on sort of like, uh, I guess, pronatalism, antinatalism. L l let me make a moral point about antinatalism, just for the sake of argument, to push back a little bit on the more recent points. Um, <clears throat> okay, uh, again, it's a moral thing. Let's say, again, let, let's be a little hyperbolic, a little extreme, and then kind of get back to the middle. Um, Let's say that you knew you were pregnant and that you knew you were going to give birth to a healthy baby and you knew that it would lead a very wonderful life for like, I don't know, 60, 70 years. And then you knew it was going to die horrifically alone and in great pain. Would you still have the kid? What does that really have to do with natalism or antinatalism? Mm -hmm. Well, because the, the basis for antinatalism is that life equals pain. And that, isn't that like Buddhism or pretty much? Or Hindu? No, no. Wouldn't that be Buddhism to a certain degree? Yeah, no. I, I, yeah, there are some. Yeah, there are some overlaps. Um, but, but again, more specifically, it's the moral value of birth. Yeah, that's that's ultimately what it boils down to. And then to question the moral value means, well, what does birth guarantee you? It guarantees pain Nothing. and suffering. No, it guarantees, guarantees pain and suffering. What if it's it over that quick? It guarantees an experience. It well, guarantees to have an experience. Whether it's good or bad, it depends a lot on. When you grow, the decisions that you take. And while you are a child, of course, there's other factors that influence, you know, uh, whether your experience is good or bad. Because, like, I know that a lot of um, antinatalism says that, oh, there's a lot of children growing with bad parents or abusive parents, right? And, uh, and you won't gonna know when that's gonna happen. But right. in, in, in no one is going to know if when it's that's going to happen. Gonna happen. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. 
So it's it's the same, going back to the example that Kelson gave, you know, it, it, the government will supply $2,000 to the foster parent thinking that they're going to do a good job taking care of those children. But the government doesn't know those parents are doing it just for the <coughs> money and abusing the children. Okay. You know, so n no one is going to know nothing like that for sure. So the the parents cannot limit or, I mean, whoever decides to have a children cannot limit their um, decision whether to have it or not have it to the knowing oh, it's going to end up living um, alone and miserable. So maybe that's in your view, but maybe the person that is dying alone and miserable enjoy Enjoys dying alone. Enjo no, enjoys his whole life or h or her whole life before, and it's of in accept pains and be alone. I yeah. like that. Yeah, uh, I like that. And and then to like okay, so uh, I invest in stocks, and one of the sectors I really invest in is, is is genomics or or editing genes in order to fix issues. I feel like within the next five to ten years, that's the that's the sector, that's the technology that's going to advance mankind. However, you have to ask yourself. Okay, what is gene editing? Yeah. We're playing God. We're 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 fixing flaws in that little human, in that little baby, in that little embryo, so they can have the best life possible. Why why are we doing that? Because we are God, man. So we you know, we 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 so are, you you you, we you play God, God every day of the week. Cut his mic. I'm joking. <laughs> I mean, we, we play God every day of the week. We're only doing what what gods do. Because, I mean, I think it's clear when you look in the mirror what you're looking at. We and attempt it, to play God. There's a difference between attempting because God at the end of the day can tell when he's going to die. You don't know when you're going to die. You don't know when your chapter, you don't know when the last words in your book is going to be written. So how could you be God when you don't even know when your play ends? I mean, that, that just depends on either. what your definition of God is. Exactly. And what if God didn't know either when you're going to die? Yeah, that's your definition of God. Is, is in, is I mean, every person, every person, and, and let me rephrase it, every person has its own assumption of what God means, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Uh, for Aaron, it, it means something different true. than for me, right? I think there's so a lot of people who agree the God, on what the God, God is. The God, the God in my, under my definition, the God I know doesn't know where, when I'm going to die or when I'm going to come to this experience. The God I know just know that I am here to help to live the experience. I am here to spread the message. In some way, in somehow, whatever I can remember of that message that I bring in, I will spread it. But if I don't remember, God is not, my God is not concerned about me not remembering. Mm -hmm. God mm -hmm. is giving me clues, leaving a stone here, a stone there. Maybe if you step on that stone, you will remember why you came from you know what what you came from what you need to do in here mm -hmm. so that 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 is in my view uh, and as excuse me, says, <laughs> seriously man <laughs> 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 my bad and uh, a, and and as Aaron says every person has its own perception of god and uh, and we are all extensions of god we are all playing somehow in some way to be god i play to be god four times when i deliver my babies you know, I, I feel a extension of God because I I was able to create a life inside of me. Mm -hmm. But that's not, uh, this mic is not working, I guess, too. Um, it's working. Yeah. It's working. It's working, yeah. 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 yeah I is. guess having a baby is not playing a God. You don't play like, a, you're not playing a God. You, you're having a, you're having a, uh, a kid. You're not creating a kid. Yeah. Or like. Goldfish what you can't be a god is because you know you can't create your mother, you can't create your father. That's why that cannot make you a god. You can you can say I create my child, but you can't say I create my mom, and that will not make you a god. Even in the definition of god, mm -hmm. what you said, he said you say he's gonna give you a clue where you, he's gonna uh, put some of them here, some of them here. If he's giving you a clue, a, a clue that means he knows the final destination. And it's it's not only about you know how the movie ends is you know we may figure out in forty fifty years when a person will die. He and knows how the movie ends, or he knows the sequence that you need to follow. Well, the uh, it's the the thing is he knows everything, but you have the we will go to free will, 
that that that's your choice that how you want to follow is your choice that's your free will but talking about god that on the point is even we figure out when we're gonna die or like i might figure out when i'm gonna die that doesn't make me a god it's not it's, uh, god god is the definition of god is not only knowing the end of points is what even we can all agree that if we some point that god is the almighty on all of us like creator is it was in a past in a present and in a future and the thing about you is even you know even even you can have a baby even you know when you are gonna die all of this or even you think that you're playing or attempting a god that doesn't make you a god that's not that's not you <laughs> Uh, being a god. God, Clip it. Is no, god is i mean if if i was misunderstood by you or somebody else i'm sorry but you've just been blessed blah 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 blessed 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 oh, blessed. Yo, I, I, I don't if know I about you but i know i'm a god john 316 I'm, I'm, I'm owning no, it no, no, no. i'm this. i'm not so, saying just you are god we are all gods we are all extensions of god natalism folks i mean it, it's it's on the bible it's on the quran it's on the torah we are all extensions of god extension that means we are extending I that we're not god if we are made to his image uh -huh. we are part of him we represent him with our actions whether if you decide to go wrong is your decision is not god's decision that's why you were created with the human free will okay okay good point so like you say we're extension of god right, we gotta get back to the topic yeah, yeah finish up finish up this, oh, yeah, this i'm point. gonna finish this one <laughs> so <laughs> so the thing is you know max have Max is a human being. Let's say Max is a god. Last week said, and Max has <laughs> a heart. Max has a lung. Max has a mouth. Max has an ear. Those mm -hmm. are extension of Max. Like when we say God, you're saying this. Max is God, and you are here, and I'm here. We all are God. The same point to you. We all are God. If you say, let's see if it's hurt. Only his heart is gonna be a god or a person. Like only his kidney is not gonna be a person. All together are gonna gonna be one person. Well, what I'm trying to say is, even you, you believe that you extend God, you're not God. You not you, you can't be God because if you say you are God, you know I have thinking of myself too that we could be all God, but that's not true. If you are God, why can't you create me? Like if if you have to be a God, you have to be um, in all things, in a future, in a present, and in a past, and you can only be in a present. So you can't be, I guess, and a God. And how you you know you cannot be in the past? I mean, if we observe other cultures, mm -hmm. the Shaolin monks can travel into the past through meditation. It's a decent can counterpoint. travel into the future through meditation <coughs> as well. Yeah. So uh, that's what I said. It's, it's a broad topic to reduce it to one thing. And, and yes, I agree with you. God is a whole thing. It's not just reduced to a piece of the human being. It's a whole thing. Everything, some would say. Exactly. And, uh, it, and if you want to believe you are an extension, you are part, or you are whole, that's up to you. Mm. All right. So, yeah, we got to put a pin in this. But mm -hmm. we could have this be a future topic. God could be a topic. Or what is divinity or what is divine? I, I like great. that. Yeah. That'd, be, that'd be a good one. Black Jesus. That <laughs> should, that should also be a topic. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the idea then, and, and just, just to put a quick bow on it, you could argue, and this is what Christian philosophers argue, like St. Augustine. They say that while we're made in the image and likeness of the, you know, the one true God, according to the Christian religion, um, and the image and likeness is not physical. It's not that we look like him. I mean, he became man. He looked like us. The way we're in his image and likeness is the fact that, you know, God is omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent, eternal, all loving, all forgiving, according to this definition of God, this, this flavor of God. Um, and human beings are kind of like that, but not really. So, for example, if God is omnipresent, that means he could be everywhere at once. If God is, again, um, eternal, it means that he transcends past, present, and future. I think. Well, let me just let me just finish real quick. The, the point being is that human beings, we can sort of be like that. So for for the Christian God, I agree. It's for the Christian God. The idea is that past, present, and future happen all at once, and even that's putting it metaphorically because yep. God transcends time. Human beings, again, we have a past and a future and a present, but we could be here in the present, remember our past. So take our past into the present and think about the future. So we take the future and the past and we bring them into the present. So you have past, present, and future all at once. That's God-like. Mm -hmm. Amazing. 
Okay, yeah. so Amazing. but we got to get back. Thank you. We got to get back to NATO. <laughs> um, God like. Well, image and likeness. So, uh, mm-hmm. so, so again, getting back to this idea of natalism. Um, well, like, you know, I'll, I'll leave it up to you. We got about ten minutes left. Do you want to anticipate discussions on civic duty? Yeah, why not? Yeah. yeah. You want to start? Okay, we can anticipate yeah, next week's stop. I think okay. I, th- I think the only civic duty civic duty that, that you have is to not be a bum. It's to it's to it's to, it's to, it's to whatever burden you have carry that burden. If you're a father, if 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 you're a father, your only duty is to, is to be a good father. If you're not a father, if you have a child and you're not a like a presentful father in your in your, in your in your kid's life, you have failed that burden and you have failed to uphold your duty and you and you, and you have failed as a man. If you're if, if 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 you're a teacher and your duty is to is to have the best interests of the kids and you and you fail that you have failed to uphold your burden, you you have failed your duty and you have failed as a teacher. I, I don't believe you inherently have any civic duty. You can take on civic duty, but I don't believe you in, inherently have any because okay. you ne- you didn't ask to be here. So technically, if you didn't ask to be here, you don't owe anything when you get here. Well, I think, I th- mm-hmm. oh, I'm sorry, but to but to but but to counteract that point, there's there's this thing called like the social the contract, which means if you're gonna be here, you have to you have to be valuable and productive. And if you're not gonna be here, it sounds kind of mean, but you could just quote unquote leave I mean, if you're not gonna can, be productive. It, it might be meaningless. It might be a drag or anything. And there are consequences for your actions. So I don't. I'm not saying that there are not consequences for being a bum. I'm not saying there are not consequences for being lazy or doing right by others. Yeah, there's definitely consequences, but you have the choice to not do those things. You owe nothing, but your actions do come with consequences. I agree with it. So the point is, so the point is we have to do something? Like if there is a consequence <laughs> on it? Mm-hmm. So that means we have to do on it. It's good good citizenship. What what things is yes. a, a citizen required to do to be a good And I think that's citizen. different than civic duty. Good citizenship does have requirements. What are the requirements? Yeah, what are the requirements? I mean that's up to for debate. I mean I'm sure in Russia they sure. have different requirements than what we have over here. Well we mm-hmm. could certainly you talk know? about that as a pressing topic. That's a big topic. Yeah, that's, yeah, a that's, topic. A that's a super yeah. loaded question. It is. Yeah. See, I think, I think, I don't know, I think we do have it, like, intrinsic, like, like, duties that we're supposed to, like, that we're supposed to oblige to, you know what I mean? Maybe it's just, it's, it's, it's just different up, up, upon your culture and your, and your upbringing, but there's certain cultures that, like, if you're, if, if your father, you know, had the duty of bringing you up from, from the ages of 0 to 25, 22, 21, until you're now a responsible adult, it is now your duty to take care of them at the latter stages of their life, and if you don't, you kind of you you're kind of quote unquote failure in their eyes. I mean, that's that's a personal obligation, but is it a civic duty? Does your society say you have to take care of your parents when they get older? Absolutely not. Yeah, that's yeah that's why not? You owe nothing. But <laughs> okay, interesting. That, that's not strictly true. Certainly in our society, and okay. there's uh, selective service, mm. for example, is. I mean, you can say that you don't owe that, but uh, I think if somebody drafts you and they come to pick you up, um, yeah. you might have a hard time arguing that. You owe the IRS. They're going to take money out your or, bank account or, every or week, and if like, you don't, you're going to jail. You know, he chose to do otherwise, and he, he dealt went, with the consequences of his went, actions. He went to jail, you, so you he always have freedom. choice, and that's, and that's the thing. I feel like choice is empowerment, and to, to say you must or – you have to, or this is this, or this is that. I mean, I think it's taking away your choice. Now, I'm not going to say, like, I, I'll admit, I play the devil's advocate on a lot of things. So a lot of the choices that it might seem that I'm supporting might just seem, you know, like a, a bastardization of, of, of just having choice in general. But that's just to kind of polarize it, or as your professor would give you the hyperbolic version of it, because you, you've got to see the spectrum to understand the gravity of the impact that it has. Well, that's true, but um, there's also the case that uh, you don't necessarily, the absolutes don't necessarily apply to what a citizen Most people, yeah, th- it do, doesn't. Right? That's, that's what makes them absolutes or hyperbolic. But the philosophical... Get, get a little closer to that, Mike, Max. Sorry, sorry, the philosophical yeah. underpinning of that also as well, um, that underlies a society would suggest that a person should do that. I mean, in existentialism, there's the idea... Um, there's a lecture by uh, Jean-Paul Sartre where he talks about a man's when a when a person chooses himself, he chooses for humanity. Yeah. And you can make the argument, uh, well, 
I, uh, I may choose not to do something because other people will not do it. Um, but that's kind of a false argument at bottom. Um, it's, I guess, an act of sort of intellectual cowardice. Um, you're sort of dodging the question <laughs> Interesting. Mm -hmm. at, at its logical extent. Okay. What, how should a person behave ultimately? Um, and you have to ask yourself that. And in doing that, you choose the ideal or the symbolic version of humanity. And so those, those principles apply when we decide what a person should do to be a good citizen in our society. I mean, they apply to you. It's well articulated. That's, I feel like they, they apply to you. You know, how, how can you, like, like who's, who, is, who, is, who is bold enough in here to sit there and really say that this is what the ideal man is and these are what the ideal morals are? Well, who's, but who in here is bold enough to say that? The Each, Constitution yeah, of the yeah, United you know, States. Every, every government document. Yeah, the Constitution. <laughs> yeah, you know, we're in, we're, Oh, let's go all the way back to Mayflower Compact. <laughs> well, each, <laughs> each person. person. Each person, though. Mm -hmm. Because, but, you, but, you but, look, because because look at that. Look at how much that's changed. Look at the original document. Look where we are now. It's not the same. You know, um, it, it, the, the meanings are not the same. Um, how we interpret it is not the same. So, like, yeah, you can sit there and say there's a document on paper that was written 400 years ago. But, like, if we're going by that... Are, are we even going by that original document nowadays? Or are we trying to write our own social contract? You know, you don't put time into the equation. And when you put time in the equation and then you, you, and you look at the fact that these things change, who are you at this point in time to sit there and say, this is how it is? And you got to admit that you know in 20 years, the more mature, seasoned, evolved you is probably going to be thinking something completely different. Well, that's, that's an excellent point, and I would argue in response to that, uh, the answer is that you choose yourself. And I would, I, also, agree. I would also argue that you can't get out of that. Um, yeah. A person is obliged to choose the better in all mm -hmm. situations. You can't choose the worst. Just simply by assigning value to something, you are deciding that one is better than the other. Yeah. I agree, you are. Especially in a capitalistic society where your money is your voice, your money is your vote. So, so like even if you don't quote unquote pick a side, wherever you sp you choose to spend your money, your time, and your and your and your, and your resources, that's that's your choice, that's your vote, that's that's the that's a contract that you chose to to oblige in. Okay, but, yeah, and just uh, uh, we're, we're kind of got to wrap up here in a minute, but um, but yeah, no, this is so. This is a nice little teaser for what's to come mm -hmm. on uh, on Wednesday. I just again keep in mind we're talking about not what makes a uh, you know an ideal human an ideal person an ideal husband or it's what makes an ideal citizen and I think to to what some of the points you're making the standard by which a citizen is judged is to a great extent determined by the government of that society mm -hmm. so again if you want to look at America citizenship uh, or civic duty you might say I mean includes things like voting um, includes things like you know. Uh, but do you have to vote? Not well. I mean, that's and ex exactly. I think you're right. That's that's part of the question. Some people would say you should be entitled to certain things, and I meant to plug this last time. Um, so I don't know if y'all remember this, but we actually decided on two topics in advance the last meeting. So next one's going to be civic obligation. The one after that is going to be entitlement. Oh yeah, I remember that. And Karen's. That's what. Well, there's okay. no. <laughs> but also we uh, and I think I, I mentioned this in the group text. Um, we were invited to collaborate with the Modern Language Club. And so they're waiting. They're making it real easy for us. They're just going to come to one of our meetings, but Perfect. they want us. Yeah, Perfect. they want us to pick a topic that's you know related to what it is that they're into. So um, it could be something like language. Or is music a language? Communication. We can I we can so. include what constitutes a language. Um, yeah. So just something else to consider. So we're we're starting to stack topics. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, remember, spring break's two weeks away. So uh, you yeah, know, we might be pushing into the uh, post spring break. Um, part of the philosophy club this semester but okay uh so yeah we've reached our hour um let's wrap up here so again you've been listening to the philosophy club radio hour uh the philosophy club radio hour we broadcast live over kdux web radio every monday from generally speaking 2 or 3 p.m um and again that's in uh, el paso hall room 11 uh it's again it's the it's the working studio on richland campus the philosophy club radio hour is a uh it's an extension of the philosophy club the Philosophy Club proper meets every Wednesday from 2 to 3 p.m. in Wichita Hall, room 211. 
very informal. We get together and we just talk. We share ideas. It's not a debate. No, nothing gets real heated. Everything's very nice. And yeah, we're just sharing thoughts. You get to hear, you know, those around you, your classmates, your your colleagues, you know, their ideas on some big stuff that, you know, oftentimes people don't have an opportunity to express their thoughts on. Uh, and so that's what the Philosophy Club offers. You could show up late. You could leave early. You could bring snacks. I encourage that. Um, and again, if you can't attend physically, <laughs> we allow you to attend virtually. All you have to do is get on your Microsoft Teams account and send a request to Dallas College Philosophy Club. And so when the meetings are going on and you can't be on campus, you can join us in that virtual room through Microsoft Teams. Next week's topic, civic obligation. Um, and so, yeah, I, uh, I want to thank my guests for coming out today. It's nice to have a couple of newbies. I hope you all return. It was great having you all here. Good to see the regulars. And I think we're going to end today with a, with a little cipher here. We're going to kick a freestyle. Oh, yeah, what's um, up? Um, <laughs> Emmanuel Kant. <laughs> I can't believe. I don't know, man. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Professor Man Z. Man Kwan. <laughs> Spells Jeffrey with a G. Oh. Uh -huh. oh. Okay. On the M I C M A N Z I C. Okay, there we go. Okay, um, yeah, Anybody want to kick a beat? No. Okay. Yeah, um, yeah, just, yeah you got to have that queued up, man. You got to have the beat ready to go. We, That's we part of the production. That. That's part of the pre-production. That's man. a good point. That's a good point. <laughs> I wish we had the pre-production. <laughs> we some tracks. We barely get production. Um, okay, cool. So, uh, yeah, I guess the, that'll the do The cipher's it. over? Oh, you can hop in. Hop in. Hey, man, it's your... Boy, Indy at the Witty City. City. ATX, boy, and you know I'm looking pretty. Got pretty. diamonds on the ring. I got diamonds on the pinky. Mm. I used to go to school and be infatuated with Miss Pinky. I mean, her name was Miss Clinky. I mean, that was Jazzy Fire. I was the type of dude to go to school and get live. I'm really not trying to cuss, but I'm still trying to bust. Yeah. I mean, when they hear me touch the microphone, everybody <laughs> going to fuss. They be fussing. No, I'm on air, so I must not be cussing. And every time... I'm in this studio, I'm like a Russian. We up here dropping bombs. I already know we ain't going to Ukraine like Saddam. I mean Saddam Hussein, young Major Payne. My name Keenan Taylor, but ain't Keenan Ivory Waynes. Y'all already know I'm in this game, I'm finna stain. Freestyle off the dome, off the dome, off the brain. No peace and chain, no pinky ring. I mean, I got no diamonds in the ear. Over my ring, y'all already know. I might. Hi guys, hi guys. I can't and I can't and I can't and I can't. Hey, you said in the studio, right? This is the thing. The good thing is, I'll cut it out. I don't do it. That's good. Yeah, but that was actually really nice, man. The Russian bar, the Russian bar was nice. I was like dropping bombs like a Russian. I was like, man, Vladimir Putin, if he heard this, you know what I mean? You gotta, you, you can't go home no more. All right, y'all, that'll do it. Um, thanks for coming out. And, uh, yeah, don't forget to think, think about, about it. it. Quack. Peace. <laughs> I had to, like, come up with a beat in my head.